I'm going to talk about how algorithms changed our society um, because as a technology reporter and I've worked for, um, I went to uh, London to work for The Guardian, I was quite interested in that topic. And uh, we, when we think of how algorithms are changing our world, we always think about information. We all know in the era of digitalization, information left records, DVDs, books, and newspapers, and digital files. As digital files, they re-entered our computers and mobile phones. So that was then, this is now. Um, but we are not only carrying our bookshelves with us wherever we go, uh, or wherever we have mobile coverage, we can also access the internet, and with it a wonderland of information. So in a certain way, it is as if we carry libraries with us wherever we are. Um, and this is not even at all. We get information wherever we stand, and we send out information about what we see wherever we are. Um, so it looks pretty much that the internet is actually mainly about information. But what is, if it, this is just the beginning of something totally different, what is if the real revolution is yet to come? What is if the digitalization isn't about information, but much more about organization? And let me explain to you why I think this is the case. Think about the disruption of publishing. Uh, well, you all know uh, that we had social media and blogging disrupting our big publishers. And, uh, well, they were, yeah. I mean, to run media in our past, we needed big companies, and we are used to all these media czars everywhere globally in the world, from William Randolph Hearst to Alfred Harmsworth to Axel Springer to Ted Turner, Leo Kirch, or Rupert Murdoch. Then the Internet came. And from that moment, things have changed. Suddenly, websites could be as influential as traditional media. You can't really read it here. This is from 1998. This is the story that broke the Monika Lewinsky scandal, Drudge Report. That was what it looked back then. So websites suddenly could be as influential and disrupt our life as traditional media. And then they also had the same reach as traditional media. The Huffington Post, for example, uh, well, yeah, zooms past the New York Times and is now still uh, pretty much as good as they are. So in the last 10 years, we experienced the disruption of traditional media. But what if this disruption can also happen to organization? Here we have the famous web page or famous essay uh, with which Tim O'Reilly uh, talked about Web 2.0, the last next big thing, which is now, uh, well, already a bit old and looks like a gray nice awn to us. And he said he was talking about blogging and wisdom of crowds. So wisdom of crowds was always thought of, yeah, more as publishing. And we all know that Web 2.0 changed us into a publishing society. Now, why am I talking about organization? If we think of organization, it is a bit like with these big media stars. To start a complex endeavor, today it takes a government or multinational corporation. So if the same disruption that unsettled our media stars will soon reach out anew, and the wisdom of crowds that Tim O'Reilly saw as a force of web to our is spreading out from blogging and social media in order to disrupt the way we organize ourselves. And so let us ponder the question, can digitalization make organizing maybe as easy as publishing? So let me explain to you why I think this is the case. I think actually the disruption of organization will be the next big thing. Now I understand why every speaker goes up here because you can't really connect with the audience if you stand in the, in the light. <laughs> you feel a little bit isolated up there. Um, so in our digital past, we have seen that technology isn't enough to start a next wave. It took the internet ages, to be uh, honest, to become a mass medium. There are several things have to co-evolve. People have to get interested. Several ideas need to push in the same direction. There needs to be some demand. 
and maybe even some excitement and emotions, as we heard this morning. At the moment, we can see two things come together. We see skills, and we see the small world, or what we talk about, Internet of Things or Industrial Internet. Now, let us first look to skills. We know that Amazon, eBay, Etsy, and Opodo, there are all sorts of platforms out there that connect things and corporate services with us. Now the customers are about to connect themselves directly and offer their skills. This is a recent trend that is not just realized by several startups, but also by several serious investors. So you see, I always go for at least two moments, otherwise an idea is not enough. So we quickly look at some examples. There's Gitsi from Berlin, recently visited and financed by Ashton Kutcher, among others, which helps you find interesting things to do. There's Skillshare, which helps you to learn and teach, and is invested by a prominent venture capital firm operating from the East Coast, Spark Capital is called. They also invested in Twitter, Tumblr, and Foursquare. And finally, something similar is Skill Pages, recently caught the attention of Microsoft, and this is helping to promote your skills. So we see there is a sort of skill movement at the moment going on on the Internet. Now think about it. When the Internet turned us into a publishing society, it was a technical trick. The distribution was done by the Internet, but that wasn't the whole story. There's a lot of things technology can do, and we customers or users don't come and go there, and the startups stand there craving for users. People need to enjoy to do something, and they need to find, to, to connect there with other people. Social media helped them to do at a larger scale what they enjoyed anyhow. It was nothing new. There was a demand for communication. And there is another thing people like. People not only like to communicate, they also like to share their experience, and they like to help. Now, one good idea is lovely, but let, let's be honest, generally, this is not enough to spark a revolution. However, there's more. Currently, there's not just the skills. We experience the rise of a smart world in which things are starting to speak. I'm a bit careful here because there, you know, there were a lot of speakers all over the past years who said the next revolution will be the Internet of Things, and it still didn't come. But we can uh, look at some examples. So what a lot of technology reporters are looking at now is the enlightenment of things, as we can say. So you know these, there's a barcode. Squared. There's an RFID chip. So there's more and more uh, ways to make things addressable or to know where things are, or even with the RFID chip to get things to talk back. There are projects like this that's uh, of the smart scientists like Deborah Eshrin from the Center for Embedded Network Sensing uh, in uh, University of California. They do a huge project uh, on it. There is IBM's Smarter Planet project, which is looking into traffic, looking into electricity, uh, and is basically pushing the idea of a smarter planet forward. And there is finally uh, a new software center, just opened last week in North Carolina, of General Electric, the old, uh, well, electricity. Uh, yeah, and they believe in the industrial internet. And of course, there is a project in Brussels. <laughs> the EU is at the Internet of Things as well. So we see there's, uh, this evolves more and more. And I think when, if this matches with the skills, there can be something really new happening. Um, <clears throat> we are about to manage our world in far more detail. We don't connect just crowds anymore, but precise situations. And this is, I think, what is uh, new. Often we just think about the Internet of Things in an economical way, but I want to take it somewhere else and show you that algorithms can actually push social change. As important as I think the economy is, there is more to society and us humans than just being economical. We're not only about making profit, and success is not only in money. We like to be social, we enjoy to help, and we all enjoy to improve our society. So what will change? 
Regardless if we run a supermarket, own a far car factory, plan a wedding, an expedition to Mars, or set up a refugee hospital, regardless of science, or business, or social aid, or everyday life, we need a list of things we already own or need to acquire. We manage things. To manage the world around us today, we need words or Excel sheets today. And this is about to change. In the near future, we don't need to call a person. We call the things directly. For as you have seen with the chips before, things can now begin to talk themselves. Or we have people who actually help us, let us know in what situation the things around us are. I'll show you a few examples in a moment. Now, in our past, planning our society has been done by the state or by multi-corporation or by a big organization. What if very soon there will also be additional projects bringing the way we live together as society forward? Let me explain to you what I'm talking about and let us, for example, turn to social aid. Now, to organize social aid, you needed the big organizations like there's Greenpeace, the Red Cross, Amnesty International. I show you their websites and you all have to find what they have in common. So this is Greenpeace, Amnesty International, and as we are here in Offenbach, there's Amnesty International in Germany, there's the American Red Cross, and the German Deutsche Rote Kreuz. So what do all these websites have in common? Any idea? Yes? The, the donate button, exactly. That's what they all have in common. They all have a donate button. The new organizations will actually function different. They don't have a donate button or they have a different sort of donate button. They will be crowdsourced, but instead of using the crowd to get in a lot of data, they're about matching the right data, which is only simple in place and time. So I picked out a few examples. This is Rinda, it's Russian. I had a Google Translate, <laughs> which function have. What it is basically is it locates space and time, and you have these sliders here where you can uh, say exactly what kind of help you need, if it's long-term help or if you need immediate help, um, and it tries to connect people on a local scale directly. Um, it's a project by Gregory Asimov. Um, uh, he worked before with Ushahidi, some of you might know it. And this is uh, the next step further, um, perfect for the situation in Russia. There is this app, the FireMobi app. Um, it's an app by a fire department which they developed because they understood that, um, well, if people have a stroke or suffer, uh, yeah, if people suffer a stroke, the most important thing is actually uh, not that the fire department or the emergency uh, arrives as soon as possible, but that people around help. So they developed this app and you can see it's a push application and it tells you, uh, well, around the corner, there's someone you could help. And if you know first aid, uh, you can actually help save lives. Um, and there's finally this, this is my, uh, I like that very much, that's Race Online 2012. That's uh, done by Martha Lane Fox. She is uh, one of the co-founders of lastminute.com. And with this project, she tries to, um, well, can give the chance to nine million British people who are not on the internet to give them a chance to uh, go and learn what the internet is about. Um, what they do, actually, what I find quite interesting is um, if you if you surf or browse further or look through the website, they don't have a donate button as the others do not. Um, they ask you to get in touch with them and they have this kind of uh, very complex interface where you can immediately say, well, I'm, I'm interested in giving lessons, I have time every Friday, I'm interested in giving sing single lessons or I can teach a group. Uh, they ask you if you are a corporation or if you are an office where well, you have a seminar room which is free every Thursday and has three computers and it's free every Thursday from four to six. So as you see, it's a very precise matching of uh, moments and it's, um, 
well, a space that is free anyhow, and they, she tries to use it uh, to get uh, people that never been on the internet before, and she tries to match all these skills of people with the demand and with the, um, yeah, with rooms and tools. Okay, so I think what we see here is, um, we could say, a very new chance that's done by algorithms. I, I think we are about to understand, or we are, we are about, in a, we, we experience a moment now that the Internet of Things finally will come, but it will come in a very different way. And what we will do, or can do in the future, is this. We can match situations, not just crowds, like the last, last uh, internet phase was about crowds, getting crowds on the internet. The next thing will be to match crowds directly with a precise situation, with a workplace, with a skill, or whatever. And I think um, that's what is about to happen. The fragmentarization for which the internet is known for will reach out now to a new field, the management of our society. With this, I could say uh, a new type of NGO is on the rise, an NGO that's not centered around money. Money will still be important and will still like, be, yeah, will be there, but it won't be the center of these organizations. It will be on the periphery. So in the future, improving our world isn't about giving money. It is about getting involved and donating your skills and if millions of people all decide to get involved a bit, this could actually make a difference. This is all just starting. We definitely are not there yet. And the more I ask you now, what will be the plea for the future? You don't need to donate, but please get involved. Thank you.